Hi everyone, thank you for joining our virtual dental shadower session. We want to remind you that in order to get your hours, you will have to take a short quiz. And as long as you get three out of five, you will earn your hours. The quiz link will be located in our link tree, which is in our Instagram bio. All right, so let's get started. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Hamza for today's session. I am handing the mic over to you. Feel free to start whenever you want. Hi guys, uh, my name is Hamza. Uh, I go by Dr. Gaj. Um, I'm a general dentist practicing in Austin and I uh, appreciate you guys having me on here. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce myself fully. Um, so I'm going to the next slide. Um, I'm not sharing the screen by the way, I'm, they're helping me because I couldn't do it on my computer. So sorry about that. But anyways, my uh, background is um, I graduated as a DMD from Midwestern University in Illinois, um, currently practicing general dentistry and focused on cosmetic and general in Austin right now. I used to work in lower income communities in Houston before that. So I did that for pretty much my first two years. And now this is my third year practicing and I'm kind of transitioned to a different aspect of dentistry and um yeah it's great um i've been kind of doing a little bit more invisalign and started a veneer case or a couple of veneer cases and you know just kind of getting more into that uh the aesthetics and cosmetics of dentistry um eventually i would like to own um i do have some ideas of like you know who i'd like to partner with and where i'd like to work so that's kind of my next um transitional phase hopefully once i get enough um, background and just a little bit more experience in the field um, okay I'll go to the next slide um, so i just kind of went by the each slide based on what they kind of had pre-made on there but i'll kind of go off route a little bit later on but for the first thing obviously is study tips and advice on staying motivated so that's like a big part of your first pre-dental career is just trying to stay in a good headspace and trying to get into dental school and, you know, trying to make good grades for it. So the first thing I tried to do is just trying to set up a routine. Um, I think everyone studies differently. Everyone practices exams differently. So I think, you know, it's a lot about trial and error. So it's basically you figuring out during undergrad, I would say was the best time because I feel like high school is good, but you don't really get challenged as much. And then in undergrad, you have to actually look out the, look out for the challenge because you can take a lot of easy classes and slide by, but I think it's good to kind of take some of those harder courses. And when you do, you kind of figure out, you know, um, how to study correctly and you studying correctly in terms of your perspective, not just like a general broad understanding of what perfect studying is. Um, so for me, I would basically like, I love to write everything. Like I would just write, 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 and I would rewrite notes. Uh, and that was a way for me to kind of revise things and remember things. So that was what I did. I had a friend who loved to type things out and then just review what they typed out. And I had another friend that just liked to read things through and they would just highlight stuff. So just figure out what your style is and what you get the best results out of and just go with that. Um, for people that you study with, I would say study groups are good, but just kind of be careful because you don't want to study with people you're super talkative with and super friendly with because sometimes that can distract you easily. So it's good to have friends that you can study with, but make sure that you're actually studying. Um, Cause I made that mistake in undergrad, you know, it's fun to study with your best friends or your girlfriend or whatever, but that can be an easy distraction. So just keep that in mind um, for the mentors. I mean, I've had a mentor at every section of my life and I still have some of those mentors and I've gained more mentors in the last year, just moving to Austin. So I think it's important to always have someone you can like turn to and ask questions to um, and make sure it's someone that is not only good in their field, but a good person in general. I think like, you know, you want to be motivated to be a better human in general and in, in dentistry. Um, I think it's good to like look up to successful dentists, but not all dentists are good people sometimes. And you want to make sure your ethics are in the right place before you, you know, get advice from them. Um, cause you can easily go down the wrong path with that. Um, but yeah, mentors don't have to be a dentist either only. They can also be, you know, in other fields, just as long as it's someone that can motivate you to kind of 
push yourself harder and do better. I think when you surround yourself with good and successful people, it kind of makes you constantly want to replicate that or just be on that same level. So um, that's something I learned. I also learned how to remove people in your life that kind of bring you down or unfortunately aren't moving a lot in their life. I think it's, you know, it's fine to be friends with those people sometimes, but uh, there's a certain point when you have to realize that if those people are dragging you down or bringing you to a certain state, then you need to move on and kind of um, cut your ties or separate your ways. Uh, so that's another thing to keep in mind. It sounds rough, but it'll help you in the long run, trust me. Um, and who knows, it might motivate them to do better too. Uh, for setting a goal, uh, I would just say, you know, what I would do is I would try to set mini goals every time. So just like every month, I would kind of set a mini goal of like what I wanted to accomplish that month. Just like, you know, it can be a tiny goal, um, just like, okay, this month I want to really get like more Invisalign cases than I got last month or this month, I want to just do my first endo on a maxillary molar because I hate maxillary molar endos. I want to at least do one this month, just kind of like these little goals. And once you set them and accomplish them in a month, it just gives you that drive to want to like do more later on. And it just gives you that confidence. So I think that's a good thing to keep in mind. Just make a little book of little, you know, goals you want to set every month. Um, in terms of mental breaks, when I was in dental school, I picked Chicago for dental school because I really love the city and I knew that I'd want to enjoy living in that city and explore it as much as I can. So that was my form of taking mental breaks is every time I had a chance, I would always explore the city and take photos and just try to like, you know, figure out different parts of the city and how to get around and whatnot. So I think it's important to, to, to realize that while studying and doing well and pre-dental pre school and dental school is important. It's also important to take care of your mental health by like enjoying yourself and just, you know, making the most of your life as a youth. Because I think when you get older, you'll look back and kind of regret those moments you didn't. Um, the other thing was just stay physically active. So if it's, you know, running, if it's working out, I think it's important to have some kind of release because you're going to have a lot of tension with all this work, with all the studying. So just kind of keep track of your body and yourself and make sure you realize that it's like a, it's a balance. You have to really like take care of yourself just as much as you take care of like your grades and everything else. Um, so yeah, those are pretty generic. Uh, hopefully you get something out of all those, but these are like a lot of the things that I picked up, unfortunately, like later on and some things that, I didn't even, you know, realize till I was done with dental school. So hopefully this will help some of you guys. Um, go to the next slide. Uh, for community service, I'd say just, just like everything I said before, just make sure you're doing something that makes you happy. Like you're taking care of yourself too. So like, don't go do community service and do something that you're not really interested in just because you're trying to get those hours because a, you're not going to love it. And B it's going to be like a chore to you. And it's going to be hard to explain that stuff when you're in your dental interviews, because they can kind of sense passion or like, you know, willingness to help the community and whatnot. So it's good to kind of look for something that is not only like helpful to the community, but something that you enjoy doing too, because it's a win-win for both situations. Um, the other thing is just switching it up. Just try to do something different every year if you can. Cause so if you have a couple of years on your sleeves before dental school and you wanna do gain, gain a lot more community service hours, try to like find a variety of things because that also shows that you like to diversify your, your abilities in helping the community. Um, so like for instance, like I coached in soccer and then um, I would go to like food drives and then I would uh, tutor kids so it's just like you kind of find little things that you enjoy doing. So like I like, I love working with kids. I like being with, around kids in general. So it was nice to be able to teach them soccer and then teach them, you know, um, tutor them at their school after school time or whatever. And it's just like being able to do that also shows that you have this consistency in like what you love doing and how you love uh, doing that certain aspect of community service. Uh, like I said, quality over quantity. So that's just another thing is just like whatever you're doing is important because, you know, they like to see some kind of like um, 
path of what you're, why, why you like helping that certain part of community service or like what your goal is in doing that. You're not just like going to some random food drive that like you just got assigned to from school or whatever. Like you actually actively looked out for something and you found something that suits you and you chose to do that because it's something you you're genuinely passionate about. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, and you guys are lucky now with Instagram and like, you know, just the resources online to find stuff. Like when I was in undergrad, I had to like really go out and look for stuff. Like there wasn't Instagram as much. There wasn't like even Facebook didn't have like a marketplace or anything like that where you could actually look up like people announcing things. So um, definitely something to be a bit more um, resourceful about. Um, go on to the next slide. All right, for choosing specialties. So I didn't specialize uh, for two reasons. One is I wanted to eventually own and I always felt like I wanted to like run a business at some point. And I liked that idea of freedom. And then the, the second reason is I just didn't want to do more school. Um, I was like pretty anxious to just get out into the field. And um, yeah, so I just kind of decided not to. Uh, I wanted to do diverse I wanted the diversity of challenges. So basically I wanted to be able to do everything in dentistry and have the freedom to like switch around if I wanted to do. So for instance, like now I'm doing higher or I'm doing uh, middle to upper income dentistry, whereas I was doing lower income previously and I got to do a lot of extraction and root canals. And now I'm doing a bit more crowns and veneers. And so it's nice that I can kind of switch around if I'm tired of one thing over another. Uh, so that was a big draw for me. Um, I did want to get into oral surgery if I did go into a uh, specialty because I remember in dental school, I really loved it. And I really liked the teacher who taught me a lot of it. Um, and she always kind of like talked me into wanting to do it. And the only drawback was again, the school and the amount of years you take uh, additionally. So that kind of deterred me from it, but I can still do oral surgery now if I want to, like if I want to do a bit more wisdom extractions, if I want to get it more into implants, whatever, I still have the freedom to do that. Obviously I can't charge specialty fees or I can't do more, but um, there are certain aspects of it that I'm still able to do. So it's not like a total loss. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide. Um, so my typical day, uh, I wake up, not super early, but to me, it's pretty early. Like, you know, I get to work at 7.45. We start with the morning huddle, which is we basically review uh, the patient charts and well, the, the schedule for the day. So once we review the schedule, we kind of figure out, you know, if everything's correct, uh, what's going on for the day, like if we need to assign anyone to anything. And um, just if there's any like specific medical histories we need to know about. So it's more just kind of like that team huddle before a game. You're just trying to make sure everything's in order for that day so that nothing goes unexpectedly. Um, for patients at current office, um, like I said, they're more concerned about like aesthetics and whatnot. So uh, with that, I try to focus a lot of my care on just being extra attentive to that and also just being more empathetic to that um, because I think it's something that the lower income communities didn't have. And so a lot of the times I would just walk in the room, tell them what they need and do the treatment. Whereas now I kind of sit in the room for longer. I spend like, you know, 15 to 20 minutes talking about their day, talking about, you know, what they like, what they don't like, just trying to connect with them more, just so I can also understand aesthetically, like what they like and what they're, um, they're looking for. So that's something to keep in mind is when you're a dentist, you're more than just a dentist. You're also like a you know, you're a friend to this person you're about to do work on, like you want to make them feel comfortable around you. And so that's something to really like take into consideration as well. Um, the toughest part about presenting the treatment plans is um, prioritizing what's important for them. So like I said, because a lot of it's aesthetics, a lot of patients are wanting to do, you know, whitenings and all this other stuff when they have cavities. So you have to kind of realign their expectations and let them know what's more important and what's a priority for them versus, um, you know, just going straight to the cosmetics. So like, you know, even if a patient wants veneers or something, it's like, you can't do veneers if they have plaque and calculus buildup. So they need perio, 
uh, or they have periodontal disease and then they need to get a deep cleaning before they can even consider that. And even if they do want to consider that, they have to think about, you know, the amount of bone loss they have and all that other stuff. So you'll learn a lot about that in dentistry and it's called phasing. So it's basically like you're, you're organizing your treatment plan based on priority and what's, what's the right thing to do. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, so what's the next slide? All right, so for dental case one, I actually repeated this one before, and that's my fault. I, um, I wasn't sure what case to bring up. I just thought this was a really good case. If you've heard this before, I'm sorry, but it's, it's an interesting case. So I had a 26-year-old male come in for a limited exam. He had a pain in the upper right. It was a throbbing pain um, that left him unable to sleep. So I took an intraoral picture. We took a periapical bite wing and a, or a periapical uh, x-ray and a bite wing. So that just, the PA helps me see the root just to see if there's any kind of infection at, in the area. And then the bite wing kind of helps me see, you know, not only their bite, but if there's anything between their teeth or anything that's causing uh, further decay or anything. Um, for the diagnosis, it ended up being the wisdom tooth. So it was fully decayed on the buccal aspect, which is the front aspect of the tooth. Um, and the decay was so far that it reached the nerve of the tooth. So the plan obviously was to extract it because we're not going to do root canal and crown on a wisdom tooth. It's just not, not, it's not a functioning tooth. So it's, you know, it's best to just remove it. So I took a look at the x-rays and I did notice that the, one of the roots were super long and it went into the sinus. Um, so if you look at the next slide, um, I'll go ahead and show you. So you can kind of see, um, if you want to just point the mouse at that very last tooth, uh, you can kind of see where that root goes into the sinus floor. Um, so right that line right where the roots are, um, it's intersecting into the sinus floor. And um, to the right is where the decay was. So uh, that dark area right where the roots are. Um, so go to your left all the way. Yeah, that one. So that's the that's the wisdom tooth. And it's you can see that one long root it goes past the x-ray. So you can't even see the end of it because it's you know really deep in there. So we'll go on to the next slide. Um, so we first, uh, just to go over the extraction tools. So I elevated it using elevators followed by forceps. So these are the extraction tools that we typically use, the two main ones. So there's uh, elevators and uh, forceps. So the elevator functions to elevate the tooth. So you're basically kind of wedging it in between the two teeth, and then you're rotating the elevator. Uh, and that's what on the lower right picture is. Those are two elevators. Those are root elevators. Um, so those are pretty good at getting, you know, when people's teeth break down to where you just see the root tip. Uh, so that kind of helps. And you just kind of, if I were to show you with this pen, I just go between two teeth and usually there's like a curve and you kind of access a purchase point on the tooth and you can kind of elevate it. And you just think about it kind of like a, uh, screwdriver where you're kind of, um, you're turning it and then it's, it's pushing a tooth, kind of giving it like a, an elevating force and, uh, you're breaking up fibers along the tooth and you're just kind of slowly kind of letting the tooth loosen out of the socket. Um, in dental school, my oral surgeon used to always recommend just using the elevator and then using the forceps at the very last step. Like you don't want to even touch the forceps until, it's fully mobile. Uh, and the reason is because the forceps are pretty aggressive. So if I were to grab the forceps and grab that tooth and just keep trying to wiggle it and pull it out, you can break the tooth. Um, and breaking the tooth is not great because once you get, if you break the top crown of the tooth and the two roots are still in there, it's going to be a lot harder to get those two roots out now, because not only are they firmly planted into the bone, but now you have a tougher time accessing it with an elevator, trying to get in there and you're just digging in there. So I don't know if you've ever, if you guys have ever shadowed a dentist, but sometimes there's those extractions that can take like up to two extra two hours or longer. And it's because of these sometimes, because they can get a lot more complicated when that happens. In this case, it would have been a lot worse because once that, if that tooth broke and the roots in that area, if I keep digging, uh, sometimes I can also pose a risk of pushing that root further into the sinus. So that can be very dangerous and not a fun situation. So um, just something to consider, you know, I know you guys are far from dental school, but always use the elevator and try to avoid taking the stairs. I'm just kidding. We should 
don't want to take the i'm just kidding okay so um different elevators serve for different functions um, you can kind of see the different sizes of those uh there's a thin elevator and it goes to a thicker one so usually i like to start with the thinner one and then gradually go higher as you get more movement just because it's like i said you want to be a bit more conservative and then kind of get a little bit more over time um there are different forceps too based on the tooth based on whether it's one root, two roots, and you can kind of see how it grasps the tooth and how you kind of, you grasp it, not at like the tip of the tooth, but you kind of want to go really deep in there uh, because it's it's kind of like physics. If you think about it, it's like a better fulcrum point and uh, you can just get a better grasp of it without breaking the entire tooth or breaking, breaking it in half, if that makes sense. So that was, you know, a little crash course on the extraction tools that we use. Uh, so maybe next time you, um, shadow a dentist, you can kind of differentiate between the tools he's using. So we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, so that's the same thing. So this is a sinus exposure situation. So if you go to the next slide, I'll kind of go over that. Um, so this isn't the picture that I, you know, this isn't my picture. I stole this off the internet, but this is basically what it was. So. Um, number one was extracted and I used the gradual increase in size of those, uh, elevators. Uh, once I got, was able to kind of get mobility, I grabbed it with the forceps and I slowly kind of, uh, got it out of the socket. Uh, once I got it out, um, I did a little kind of test to see if his sinus was exposed. I just had him breathe in and out through his nose and, uh, with the mirror, I kind of looked in this uh, extraction site to see if this little area was moving. Um, and then it's basically like a breathing technique. And luckily, you can see here that there's a hole in this membrane. So that that blue, basically right now what you're seeing is um, if the hole, there, the hole is where that uh, sinus membrane is, and that's an exposure right there. So you don't want that to happen. Uh, and then wrapped around it is a little bone and then wrapped around that is a little bit of uh, gingiva. So what I saw was I saw the membrane, but I didn't see the hole there. So that was good because I could see that there was no exposure and, you know, I got really lucky because it was through the bone, but the membrane was still moving uh, and it was intact. So usually if you see the membrane moving, it's kind of like a, a balloon. If you think about it, if I hold a balloon, I blow through it, it's going to open and close. But if there's a hole in the balloon, air is just going to pass in and out. So it's not going to move in and out. So that was my technique of figuring out if it was um, exposed. So luckily, because it wasn't exposed, I still did a basically a, a technique to kind of keep it, uh, I guess, safe. So I put a collagen plug in there. So it's a little piece of like foam uh, that you plug in there and it packed it tight. And then I followed it with membrane, which is basically like a, acts like a membrane to kind of protect that foam. And then you suture over that to keep that in place. And that way the foam won't come out because the membrane's holding it in place and it'll heal nicely without any more, um, you know, uh, interferences with the membrane. Um, so for post-op instructions, you just tell the patient, you know, to be careful with the, you know, not sneezing with their mouth closed. Um, try to avoid sucking through a straw and, um, you know, just kind of being careful about building pressure in that area because it can easily cause, um, issues in this case, I don't think it would have, but it's just something you want to do to be uh, extra cautious. Um, so yeah, that was my little sinus exposure thing that really wasn't a sinus exposure, but it's sometimes cool stuff like this. You come across in dentistry and you just have to learn how to approach it well and be uh, well prepared. So uh, we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, so this is just precautions for the sinus exposure. So in case I remember at the last uh, presentation I did, people were asking about like what the precautions you take are if you do get one. So it depends on the size of the exposure. Um, so between one to two millimeters, not a big deal. So like in my case, I didn't even have that much. So I just didn't, you know, I wouldn't have had to worry about it two to four millimeters, you have to follow up with a patient about one to two weeks. Um, you still do what I did basically, but you also want to just be extra cautious about following up with them. Uh, and then larger, you have to kind of do uh, a little bit more. Uh, and I don't want to really get into that because it's a lot, but uh, I left this here for you guys, if you want to follow into it, but basically you just want to 
use a flap to kind of cover that uh, hole and it's just, it's a whole process. So just my biggest advice is try not to get a sinus exposure. And if you do try to make sure it's not six millimeters or above, because it's going to be a lot. Uh, usually you refer it to an oral surgeon, but you don't want to be that guy that keeps referring these to oral surgeons because they're probably not going to like you. Um, just, they probably will actually, it's probably like good business for them, but maybe the patient won't like you because you're dealing with a lot of stuff like that. Um, and yeah, if you do that, you know, antibiotics are also important, um, just because you don't want an infection to get in that area. Uh, so we'll go over to the next slide. So I'm a big advocate of mental health. And I think unfortunately in dentistry and in pre-dentistry, it's not really addressed as much. And I'm pretty happy with how things are going nowadays with social media. I feel like a lot of that is focused on more and people are paying more attention to it. So just one thing I just want you guys to like keep in mind is like, it's great that you guys are doing all this, but like take moments to take time to yourself and just kind of um, appreciate what you've done and what you've accomplished so far and like congratulate yourself because, you know, it's not easy doing what we do and going through what we go through. Cause I mean, I feel like, you know, medical students and stuff get all, you know, get the respect of like what they go through and, you know, people think they go through a lot of stuff, but we equally deal with a lot of stress and um, expectations. So like, you know, don't be too hard on yourself. It's good to push yourself, but if you feel like it's affecting you mentally, like you need to take time to yourself and uh, figure out how you can, you know, help yourself out. Uh, take breaks, take vacations, hang out with your family when you need to. Don't take that for granted uh, because at the end of the day, like, you know, none of this really matters if you don't have like your family or close friends around uh, because you need those people when like times get tough, especially in dental school. Like it's good to have people to turn back to when you need them. Uh, so don't push anyone away because of dental school or dentistry or in general. Um, try not to compete, especially if you're in dental school, you're not going to do yourself any favors by like, hiding your notes or not wanting to share stuff. It's better to share and want to help others because you'll definitely get it back. And if it's not like in dental school, you'll get it back later on. Cause like I have friends that I've known through dental school. And I mean, the amount of stuff I've learned from them because of just, you know, just being friends and being friendly in dental school is like paid off huge. So just keep that in mind. Um, help your neighbors, like, you know, even you're in dentistry, like try not to be competitive with other dentists around you. Try to like refer patients to dentists, you know, it's, there's no competition. Like there's more than enough patients to go around. Uh, try not to like be the type that just wants to hog all the patients and just like not want to share your wisdom or help others when they need it. Cause it's just not going to really help anyone. And it's not even going to help yourself. So just keep that in mind. Uh, be social. So like I said, don't close yourself off because even when you do get into dentistry, a lot of it's social socializing. So try to be, um, you know, try to be outgoing if you can. You know, I'm a, I'm pretty introverted, but I try to like put myself out there when I need to, especially when it comes to patients. I definitely try to be more open and show a bit more emotion to that because I think patients definitely appreciate it and they feel more comfortable when they know that they can be friends with their dentist. So keep that in mind. Um, surround yourself with people you love, you know, places, things. So like I moved to Austin because I love the city and like I went to undergrad here. And so I wanted to be here ultimately. I didn't choose this place because, because of my job or because of anything. Like I ultimately knew I wanted to be in a city that I love. So just think about where you want to be in terms of dental school also. Like you don't want to just pick a school just to pick it. Like make sure you, you like where you're going to be for the next four years. Um, just take all that into account because it can easily affect you and how you perform if you're not happy where you are, right? So just keep that in mind too. Um, go on to the next slide. Um, additional advice, I repeated some of this stuff, but mentors, super important. So you know, if you need a mentor, don't be afraid to reach out to people and just ask them. Most of the time, people will just be flattered that you think of them in that way and that you'd want to be um, mentored by them. So, you know, don't be afraid to reach out and don't let ego kind of take advantage of you for that. Um, read all the free resources after you graduate. So um, I kept a lot of the stuff I had in dental school, like a lot of the notes I had, a lot of the free seminars we had in dental school, like I, it's good resources. And a lot, a lot of times 
that stuff is super expensive in the real world. So try to save as much as you can, especially if you know it's going to be important later on. Um, free CEs, they're your best friends. So try to take, like, even after you graduate dental school, you're going to constantly be learning. So like, take as many CEs as you can. And if they're free, like more power to you. Uh, just try to make sure it's CEs that apply to what you want to do. So like, I, I really love working with kids. I love um, doing cosmetic stuff. So I try to take CEs that help me in those regards. I'm not going to take like a random, um, I don't know, I was going to say endo, but I'm actually taking a root canal CE soon because I want to get better at endo because I hate endo. So like, you know, you can also do that. If you hate something and you want to get better at it, take CEs for that. So just kind of remember to tailor it to what you want. Don't just take it because it's free and available. Um, but what else? Uh, attend dental conferences. So there's a bunch of dental conferences that are a really cool way to network, cool way to meet people, cool way to get free stuff. Um, and it's just a nice way to travel. Unfortunately, with COVID right now, you know, it's not as easy. But when things go back to normal, uh, try to go to these dental conferences because you can also take CEs there and you can catch up with your friends from dental school or you can catch up with old dentists that you know. So it's nice. Uh, last thing is just treat people with kindness. It's from Mary Styles. Just be nice to everyone and try to be the best person you can be. And I mean, it just inspires other people to do the same. Uh, I mean, I'm not perfect and I've definitely been a jerk often, but I'm just trying to like realign myself to be a little bit nicer and help out people as much as I can. And I've definitely seen the rewards in the last you know year and a half just from even putting a little extra effort in that. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, I think that's it. Let's see what the next slide is. Yeah, that's it. So um, thanks for having me on here. Um, I guess if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, perfect. Um, so we'll just take on question and answers. So for the first question we have, if you had found a hole in the sinus, what would have been your next course of action? If I had found a what, sorry? A hole in the sinus. Oh, um, so I kind of like I showed you the sinus exposure protocols. Um, so for, if you go to that last slide again, I can kind of go over each one a little bit again. There, go one over. I don't know, go forward. Oh, no, you're going backwards. Go forward. Yeah. Uh, one more. That one. Okay. So sinus exposure precautions. So you can see it right there, the one to two millimeters, two to four millimeters and six millimeters or more. Um, so those are the kind of steps you go through if you get exposures. Um, so yeah, I, you're welcome to go through all that. I didn't want to repeat it all just cause it's a lot of, it's just wordy. Um, but basically you just want to not go six millimeters or above because then you have to take extra precautions like making a flap, which involves basically like cutting a piece of um, your, your buckle tissue and kind of like covering it up and whatnot. So it's, it's not a fun situation to go through. Um, so for the next question we have, what do you think are some things that helped your application to Midwestern? I really want to go there as well, and I'm not sure what kind of applicants they're looking for. Um, I, they didn't specifically say what helped me in my applications, but I did do a lot of um, community service, and I was involved in a lot of like activities outside of um, didactic stuff. So, you know, I played soccer. I... I just tried to diversify the things I was doing outside of school because I felt like that differentiated me. So I think a good thing to consider is trying to be outside of the norm. And I know that's a risky thing to say, but I think, you know, it's not that risky if you just do a little bit more um, extracurricular stuff and just try to emphasize like your personality and your character. So like, I'm really into tech. So like I worked at Apple for, you know, a couple of years before I applied and I worked at the Genius Bar, so I, in my essay, I even like, um, I focused on how being an Apple genius can easily transfer to being a dental uh, or a dentist because, you know, we both deal with anxious people that come in and expect bad news and are scared to come see us and we charge them a lot of money and like we have to realign their expectations. So it's like, 
try to figure out how what you do can apply to dentistry and how you can emphasize that in your essays. So I think your essays can say a lot for you in terms of elaborating on why you did this or why your stats, like you're basically, your stats are just numbers and your essay is a way to describe those numbers and why you have them and like what they mean to the person reading them. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so for the next question is, how do the general dentist everyday work hours after dental school look like? How does a general dentist after work hours? No, it's like general dentist everyday work hours after dental school look like. Oh, okay. Um, it just varies. Every dentist is different. Um, every city is different. I know some friends that work Monday through Saturdays and, you know, they work Mon like Monday through Friday um, is typically like eight to five or nine to six. And then Saturdays, it's usually like nine to two or 10 to two. Um, and that also just depends on your city. So for instance, like Austin, like people here love the outdoors, people love going out. So like Saturdays are not as productive. So not a lot of dentists work on Saturdays just because nobody wants to go see a dentist on Saturday. They want to go outside and go running and stuff. So I were, when I worked in Houston, I worked on Saturdays because I feel like it was a bit different. People did like to come see the dentist on Saturdays. So that wasn't a problem. Um, when you own, you can always consider working two days a week, three days a week and have an associate working for you. So every, you know, there's an unlimited array of like work hours. It just depends on your situation, where you're working and a bunch of stuff. Okay, so for the next question is, is there something you wish you'd done differently both in dental school and as a newly practicing dentist? Um, not really. It's one of those things like, you know, you can always like think what if or like what if I did this or what if I did that and you can live in kind of like regret, but I just, I, I've never thought that way and I try not to. If I had to give you an answer, just to give you an answer, I would say like, I wish I didn't stress about things as much in dental school, but inevitably I would have, like, even if I went back now, I still would have, I think that's something you can't control. And I think that also helps me because it made me do better and it kind of like pushed me to do, to study a bit more. But um, yeah, I guess I would just try not to be as mentally like, you know, um, deteriorated from, you know, all the stresses of dental school. Okay, so the next question is, how do you deal with loans? What is your plan for loans? Uh, loans suck. I mean, there's no real, like, perfect way to approach it. You just, everybody is different. Um, I think the best thing to do is try to, like, treat your first few years as, like, conservative as possible. So just try to be responsible with your first few paychecks. Um, get a good financial advisor or an accountant to help you with, like, you know, restructuring your payback and how you're going to handle that. And I think just try to like be smart about your finances. So even when you graduate dental school, try to like spend a bit more time educating yourself about the financial aspect of dentistry. I think we learn so much about hand skills and like techniques and all this stuff, but we don't learn how to handle our money. And I think that's a big flaw in dental school that I hope they fix. But until then, you, you have to put that responsibility on yourself to go read and learn yourself. Okay, so for the next question is, is there a fun experience that you had during dental school? Fun experience? Yeah, I mean, my entire dental school experience was fun. Um, there's a lot. I mean, just the people I had in my class, it was great. Like, you know, I, I made a lot of great friends in dental school. You guys will make a lot of amazing friends in dental school. It's like, you guys go through so much together. You become a lot closer. Um, I did a mission trip to the Dominican with a couple of friends and that was a blast. You know, I was able to treat a bunch of people and then we lived in a tree house in the middle of the Dominican Republic. And that was amazing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any singular thing, but if I had to pick one, I would say the Dominican Republic retreat was pretty awesome. So if you guys get a chance to do a retreat while you're in dental school, uh, not only is it rewarding, but you, you learn a lot too. So definitely take advantage of that. Um, so the other question is, your bio says you're a big movie buff. What's your favorite movie currently? Uh, 
That's my favorite question so far now. So um, that's tough. I feel like I don't ever have a specific favorite movie, but I guess if I would say lately, I watched The Social Network twice again, just because I really love, um, I just lo love the director. He's done like Fight Club. He's done, um, I don't know if you guys have seen Mindhunter on Netflix. Um, there's a lot of amazing movies. Um, so yeah, I'd say The Social Network. And then I just recently saw Mortal Kombat and it wasn't very good. So I was bummed about that, but yeah. Thanks for checking out, guys. So now we have a last question. So what's your favorite you do? Sorry, I cut off. What did you say? Um, so for the la uh, second last question, actually, what do PSU American schools look at? I'm sure it differs, but in general. I mean, it's, it's up every year. So I remember when I was applying, it was like 3.8 was like the average GPA of acceptance. So I don't know what it is now, but I can definitely guarantee it's probably higher because every year it's just more and more competitive. And, you know, I hate to tell you guys that, but that's just how it is. And dental schools are small as it is. So I would say if you're, as long as you're above 3.7, you should be okay. But I mean, even if you aren't, don't let that be a deterrent, but it definitely helps. And I think you have a lot of ways to balance it out with, like I said, community service, all other extracurricular activities, um, your GAT scores. So don't let just the GPA drag you down. That's not going to, that's not going to be a huge weight on your uh, thing. Just try to be obviously about 3.0. That's like pretty obvious, but um, the higher the GPA, the better, um, the less stress you have to deal with in terms of like worrying about other stuff. So just keep that in mind. Okay. So we have the last question now, what is the best time to go for a residency and how many years is necessary? Um, usually you go to residency right after dental school. So, I mean, I think that would be the most, that would be the best time just because everything's still fresh. You're just out of school. You're still in that mindset of like school oriented and, you know, focused. Um, I think it's harder to do that when you're out for a while. Um, if you're talking about like specializing, even then, like, I think the longer you wait before going back to school, the, the tougher it will be not only to get back in, but also just for you once you're in there, because you're so used to like this different lifestyle. So um, I would say the best time is just to do it right after dental school. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Hamza, for taking the time to talk to us about your profession. It's truly appreciated. And I, and I know I learned a lot from your presentation. To our viewers, that our quiz is linked in our link tree and in the description of this video. The quiz will stay open for 24 hours, after which it will close and scores will be sent out. Remember, a three out of five is required to receive credit for our session. To Dr. Hamza, I want to thank you again for today. Everyone have a great day. Thanks, guys.